How's it going guys? My name is Graham and welcome to Two Left Thumbs. This is the fourth and final part of my finding the references videos for completing the mission. Oh, it's taken a while to get here. It's funny that these videos have consistently taken about a month to make, and yet people are always curious why I'm not uploading faster. There's a pattern. These videos take a while. But truly, no one is more excited than me to finally see this through. I didn't realize quite how much I was biting off when I said I was going to do all the secrets and references in the Henry Stickman collection, but I'm so glad we're finally here. You know, excluding the fact that I still plan to do one big video at the end that covers all of the missed references that you guys have shared from throughout this series. But that's a bonus video. I'll get around to it eventually. I probably need a break. Scrabdackle is launching its Kickstarter on March 16th. Its landing page is up now. There's links in the description and a pinned comment. Please give that a look, possibly a follow. I'll talk more specifically about the game at the end of the video. Your support there, as well as here, is so greatly appreciated. First, the last infiltrating the airship branch, rapidly promoted executive. And first to match with that from fleeing the complex is Ghost Inmate. Henry defeated the right-hand man, but still led the Top Hats to an effective escape from the government. He was against them, now he leads them. Later, at the wall, he backstabs Ellie in order to get away alone and undetected. This route starts only three days after fleeing the complex. Ellie broke herself out of the wall and followed Henry to the airship. Ellie convinces everyone to have a mutiny against Henry. He is technically still in charge, even though Reginald was kind of sneakily sliding back into that role in his absence. Thomas Chestershire and Jeffrey Plum actually stick up for Henry as being a pretty good leader. Thanks guys, you the OGs. Henry must avoid being walked off the plank if he chooses Chainsaw, which I guess we did see once prior when fighting Right Hand Man and infiltrating the airship. Although it's played off as less of a direct reference this time, it still is a bit of a callback. Henry cuts through the plank, anticipating an Acme, Wily, Coyote-style physics dropout with the ship falling away instead. Hmm. Definitely thought the other side would fall, like in all the other cartoons. Did this game just acknowledge that it's also a cartoon? Interesting. If Henry instead pleads, Ellie shuts him down and opens fire, I don't think so, Tim, is a direct quote from the character Al Borland directed towards Tim Taylor, played by Tim Allen, in the 90s sitcom Home Improvement. I don't think so, Tim. <laughs> That would almost make more sense paired with the chainsaw since we're talking tools. There's not a very strong connection there, but as someone who grew up watching Home Improvement, I still appreciate it. The save state finally comes into play. I mentioned in a previous installment that the load state had a specific function when it came up in the Jewel Baron route. If you use the save state here, you get a note in the bottom corner, state zero saved. When playing a game in an emulator, save states are used to save a game at any time, even outside of anything intended by the actual game. You click a hotkey, that moment in time is saved and locked in at a specific save state. State zero would be that default slot. Immediately after this, Ellie shoots Henry with a Bon Jovi fail text with lyrics from Shot Through the Heart. Instead, Shot Through the Leg and You're to Blame, you give save states a bad name. If you perform this save action first and later play the Jewel Baron route and use load state, you will be teleported to this exact moment. Although there is no new interaction, Henry will again be shot after each load. That's kind of a play on the fact that save states can be more of a curse than a blessing. If you save in a moment outside of what the developer intended, you could potentially soft lock your game. No matter what you do, you're going to die on that load. Helicopter Hat has Henry give a salute and jump on purpose. He then flies to safety using an Inspector Gadget style flying hat, although he does not need or use a go-go gadget style activation phrase. Henry crashes through the side of the airship and ends up in Dave Pampa's cell. The rapidly promoted executive ending left the airship intact, so he's simply been locked up all this time, although now we have Thomas and Jeffrey locked up beside him because of that opening scene. The crash landing and sprawled position of Floyd Winters is a lot like that of Henry's jetpack fail, plus the whole act of busting through the wall, that might be subtly calling back to that moment, but if that was Puff's intent, I feel he would have just went for it. He's already called back to that fail directly once. You know, comedy comes in threes. Looking at it now, I'm almost surprised it's not done in a more obvious way, which makes me think it's a coincidence. Toppy is meant to be a play on Mario's Cappy in Mario Odyssey. Henry uses this to take control of Floyd, who has a key to the cells. Seemingly, this is the same key which would have served a key role in the big ol' sword secret within infiltrating the airship. 
Thomas and Jeffrey do not recognize Henry and toss him overboard. Mind Crystal is a fun play on the character control indicators that hover over the heads of the characters in the Sims franchise. Usually, those are just an indicator to show which character you have selected. There's a hilarious implication here that anytime you're playing the Sims, you're some godlike overlord who's dropping into this world and temporarily seizing control of people's minds. There's some dark game theory potential there somewhere. Henry can choose several options for Floyd, including mock prisoner, discuss movie spoilers, and unlock cell. Two are relevant in-game actions. I think discuss movie spoilers is one of the options in The Sims games. Floyd becomes frustrated with this and pulls a gun instead. Shaloob! His phrase and the fail text are both Ugh, shaloob, which is identical to the Simlish used in the Sims franchise. Henry is presented with three Microsoft Word documents of cryptically named plan options. They obviously look like Microsoft Word, although nothing in game specifically calls them that. Got to avoid those trademarks, the same way we have Simsong TVs. I would love to hear your pitches for a stigmatified Microsoft Word processing software. The Good Gents is likely named after Goodfellas, but the plan does not last long long, or work at all, really? What? That's OP. They better be nerfing that in the next patch. That would be a common gaming gag, with nerfing being the process of making a particular part of a game something OP or overpowered and making it less powerful. Midnight Surprise simply has the characters plant explosives and detonate them at the stroke of midnight. I suppose it was too effective? Ah, just like old times. Is that in reference to blowing up the airship before? It obviously wouldn't have happened before in this particular path, but it could be talking about old times more broadly? A note specifically for us rather than these characters? Regardless of fourth wall breaks, it was a poorly thought out plan. Deuces has them simply slip away in an escape pod. This is left rather open-ended with the questioning, mission complete? The pod smacks into Reginald and right-hand man, and we see in the end screen that Ellie stepped up as the new leader on the airship, while Henry remained leader of those loyal to him, including Dave Pampa now. This results in the ending Top At Civil Warfare, which is possibly the most open-ended in all of the collection. Many fans have suggested that if a sequel to the Henry Stickman collection and completing the mission were ever to be made, this should be the branch that is explored further. But just to be 100% clear, this was not done as sequel bait. Puff has stated repeatedly that he is done with this series. And while we can say never say never, he seems pretty firmly committed to leaving Henry Stickman where it is. It's an interesting way to leave things off and allows the fans to run wild with possibilities, but it is not meant to indicate another installment in the series. But yeah, write all the fanfics you want and who knows, make a fan game or two. The next branch would be rapidly promoted executive and convict allies. Henry firmly claims his place as the leader of the Top Ats, betraying and escaping from the government. Then when held at the wall, works alongside Ellie to escape as a pair. She decides to join the Top Ats with Henry, and he reclaims his leadership role from Reginald. A government raid is almost immediately underway, and they must activate an emergency five-minute launch of the orbital station. Henry leaps from the tower and executes a devastating super punch that sends the helicopter flying into the distance before exploding in a blaze of misery? <sighs> The lackadaisical way in which Henry jumps and punches is meant to mimic the mannerisms and titular punch of One Punch Man, but Henry then plummets to the ground. The very accurate targeting system is lifted straight from modern Fallout games. I love the added little detail of showing the body parts of a stick figure in a more detailed manner, separating out the limbs on screen as if they're some complex anatomy. Notably, targeting is spelt wrong. Definitely not intentional. I expect it to be fixed soon. The UI that pops up down below, indicators for each body part, and slow-mo firing are recreations of the VAT usage in Fallout.
it is a common frustration with players that 95% accurate shots seem to miss much more often than the 1 in 20 times they statistically should. The successful option is to board the helicopter using the wrist strapped grapple hook, which is an item taken from the Just Cause series, commonly used to grapple and swing around, rather iconically in-game between aircrafts. This also acts as a callback to the bail fail option in the presumed dead route, where Henry deployed a chute and tried to sail to safety. I suppose the Henry of convict allies somehow acquired one, while that presumed dead path Henry did not? With the choice of helicopter and a massive smile on his face, Henry comes zooming in, executing the one and only greatest plan that we've seen Charles attempt numerous times before. Who do you think you are, Charles? Interestingly, rapidly promoted executive and convict allies specifically are two branches where Henry barely interacts with Charles. And because of this, he never really would have seen Charles in action and his reliance on this plan. The four times this plan has come up with Charles, including one attempt in completing the mission, and one time of simply pitching it as a plan, all would have taken place in routes other than what led to this moment. Great minds think alike, and as my grandma always says, and fools seldom differ. Somehow Henry impressively manages to shoot everyone but Reginald when using the mounted gun, but the helicopter goes down immediately after Bomb has been planted comes from the Counter-Strike series. His ally then questions the accuracy of the statement, since it's instead a giant EMP. Isn't this an EMP? I guess this soldier just insists on sticking to the script, no matter the explosive device on hand. Revolver activates McCree's Deadeye ability from Overwatch. It's high noon. It's high noon. Although, as it plays out, Henry proves that he may just be the slowest shot in the West, or literally anywhere else. Were you waiting till high noon 30 to shoot? The design of the boomerang, as well as the hand aiming, sound effects, yellow markers, and stunning effect all come from The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker. And as boomerangs famously do, it flies back and stuns Henry as well. We get the pun, what a stunning performance. The janky flute playing reminds me of attempting to learn the recorder for music classes in elementary school. This is all meant to be a reference to A Link to the Past. Although funnily enough, in that game the instrument titled Flute actually looks more like the blue ocarina seen later in the series. Eventually this can be used to summon a little bird friend and fly around with him. I'm not sure what song Henry plays, but it's nothing like the song Link plays to summon a bird in his game. The little bird friend that comes to help Henry is much like that scene in The Legend of Zelda, although Henry's little bird is blue while the Zelda one was white. Maybe to match the ocarina? Kind of reference it in that indirect way? Or simply to feel like less of a one to one copy? It's a strange decision to swap that out. I'm sure there was a reason. Henry crashes down among another fighting group. Despite beating right hand man previously, he demonstrates his intense loyalty by immediately standing his ground with Henry. The summon comes straight from Final Fantasy VII, with the little circles instead having top hat like icons. A giant shoop emerges from the dark side of the moon, an obvious callback and seemingly ultimate form of the continually recurring shoop character, but after all that build up, he is too late. This is likely a joke on how long summons take in Final Fantasy VII, the animations just take a while. Last week, but not to worry. But also the fact that flying all the way from the moon would have taken a long time. Style on him is a team effort with a flipping head bop sound effects and style pop-ins that are all referencing Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door. We aren't really shown why this is a fail. I guess because taking out one soldier out of the seven surrounding you isn't very good. Charge is a beautifully simple reference to the iconic World of Warcraft video with Leroy Jenkins. Uh, Alright, thumbs up. Ready, guys, Let's or... do this. Leroy Jenkins! Henry! Oh my god, he just ran in. Oh my god, he just ran in. 
was the team's response to Leroy completely ruining their planned raid. Not my fault! Leroy, you were just stupid as hell. At least Henry's got chicken. Dual Tech is a wildly elaborate sequence with Right Hand Man superpowering Henry into a whirlwind of gunfire. Don't question how he doesn't vaporize him with his laser eye, it's too cool to be questioned. The concept of Dual Techs comes from Chrono Trigger. In that game, Chrono and Robo have a few similar Dual Techs like Supersonic Spin and Cyclone Sweep, but the one in the Henry Stickman collection here appears to be wholly unique. What cool name would you give it? Handgun Hurricane? That's the best I've got. Pitch me some of your ideas. The way the enemies disintegrate also comes from that game. Afterwards, we see Reginald looking on through his binoculars, and he busts out a very Owen Wilson-like wow. 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 This binocular zoom out seems familiar as well, but I can't think of anything specific. Ellie picks up Henry and Right Hand Man and races up the ramp. We've Got Company has become an iconic, commonly used action movie phrase. We've got company! It's considered one of the most overused lines in film history by some. So we need backup. We've got company. Whoa, we're gonna have company! Benny, Eddie, we got company! And a fun insider joke and nod to film history by others. If you do nothing in the quick time event, the Jeep is stopped by Major Herschel Panzer, suited up in some heavy duty Warhammer Space Marine armor. Flipping the perspective of how it was brought up in a previous video, Herschel is Johnny Panzer's father. And again, Panzer is German for tank. Makes sense when he's a big tank of a boy. Choosing Ellie, she steps up and starts firing from behind the wheel, sending the vehicle flying off the ramp. This is a bit of a running joke in the Stickman series. Henry has crashed his car while in a high speed chase trying to shoot a gun, and Charles crashed his helicopter when attempting to snipe while airborne. So each of the main three have done it once. Right Hand Man rocket boosts the jeep and sends it crashing through the ship, much like the Holdo maneuver, and that is now the third time I've said something looks like that. And none of them look quite right in my eyes. You guys have to help me out here. Are each of these separate references? And are any of them actually a direct reference? And if so, what are they reference? I, I just I just need a hand. <laughs> I'm clearly overthinking or underthinking. It's just not clicking. Henry busts out this awesome uppercut finishing move, but is left behind. His little gasp right before the choices appear is very Link-like. The gravity inverter seems like a classic Gadget Gabe sort of item with its own instructional manual and everything, but nothing indicates this is actually the case. It's equally as foolproof as his usual gadgets. As in, not at all. Cloud has Henry riding up towards the rocket on a Cloud platform from the Mario franchise. There's a chance it's more specifically meant to be a Lakitu Cloud. True to its series, it eventually times out and drops Henry. Abandoned Tank has Henry back up a tree and blast the ground to rocket himself into the air. This reminds me of the janky physics exploits you could utilize to launch your way around the map in the Grand Theft Auto series. People even would specifically do this with tanks. Reginald grabs hold of Henry in a way that's meant to mirror the betrayed ending. Reginald even calls back to this, indicating that he could drop Henry if he wanted to. That was a close one, Henry. But I'm not going to pull you up. See, without you, I become the leader of the Tuppet clan again. I just wanted to look you in the eyes as I took it all back. Goodbye. Gotcha, Henry. You know, I could drop you right now and nobody would know. But why would I do that? We get a special end narration from Reginald explaining that Henry is firmly the leader, Ellie is now the right hand lady, him and right hand man are out doing field operations. The whole thing feels like the way that an 80s or 90s comedy or rom-com would have an end narration, explaining where each of the characters ended up. I don't really know why they have that specifically in this ending, but I still enjoy it either way. This earns Top At King. During this sequence, we have a brief appearance from Pablo Sleuth, who is actually not featured anywhere else in the game. Their name and design are plays on the MS Paint Adventure series Problem Sleuth from Andrew Hussey. The joke of him being always armed builds on an in-world gag where those characters stylistically do not have any arms. 
Next down the line is rapidly promoted executive and presumed dead. Henry rose to the rank of top at leader, betraying the government, and he escaped the wall on his own, tricking those in charge by faking his death. A character who walks into this wintry tavern is meant to reference the characters of Nintendo's Ice Climbers. Their names are Nana and Popo, while our Stickman character combines them as Nacy Popo. Much like the Ice Climbers, she has recently been on a mountain climbing expedition to map out these mountains. We have two drunk soldiers rambling about the Top At clan's secret base. It's pretty funny to realize that just a few tables away, we have Ice Pick and Snowcap from the Top Ats discussing the plans themselves. This is a critical splitting point from the little nest egg route that is simply dependent on which of these pairs Henry overhears while disguised as the mysterious vagabond. By the way, I like the detail that what he's using to cover his mouth as part of the disguise is the same purple scarf we would have seen him wandering in the cold with after presumed dead. These two drunk bumbling goofs are named Josh Taylor and Drake Camper, in reference to Nickelodeon's Drake and Josh. I love the song featured here, it's titled Two Idiots, and it's done as a slow, sloppy, drunken sounding version of the wall's main theme. One of these hungover goofs makes their airdrop a little too soon, with Henry floating down on a cliffside. The rope has Henry grapple the side of the cliff, with his stationary animation, the way he bounces and angles, reeling himself in and out from that grapple point, and failing to successfully connect is straight from the Worms franchise. Attempting to climb straight up the face incorporates a stamina wheel much like that seen in Breath of the Wild. As the stamina runs out, Henry opens up an inventory whose UI is directly from that game to inspect his items. We can see that he currently has zero rupees as well, which I think makes sense, there probably aren't any rupees to be found in his world. It's funny that they would even track that. He has two cooked kielbasa, a slice of pizza, and a cupcake. The continuity of carrying the cupcake is great, as we saw this in a separate presumed dead path, Special Brovert Ops, as a failed option. Maybe it's something they sold at that tavern. The kielbasa reads, instantly refills some of your stamina wheel, cooked by a sweaty bar chef. That's what gives it that delicious salty flavor. Maybe he got this, the pizza, and the cupcake all at that tavern. Stopping to eat has Henry disengage and fall away from the cliff. Abuse the physics engine is a fourth wall breaking trick, as it somewhat acknowledges that this is a game, and is something that is commonly featured in speedrunning communities. Finding a strange glitch that you can then exploit and allows you to bypass sections of a game. We have these two guys betting that they think Henry will show up to stop their operation. Ten bucks says he shows up and stops our entire operation. Yeah. All right. Henry ducks behind a tiny wall to hide from the scouting tower. Pulling the knife out a couple times and twirling it around is straight from Counter-Strike. Henry then charges forward, swinging the knife around before getting sniped. We can see in the top right, AWP is life, got a headshot, and Henry sticking. AWP is the type of sniper this guy is using, lifted from Counter-Strike. Everyone knows you run faster with a knife. Comes from FPS Doug and the old Pure Ponage video series. Doug most commonly played Counter-Strike in those videos, you wanna go for a jog, man? Okay, but what are you doing with a knife? What do you mean? I run faster with a knife. Everyone runs faster with a knife! And he also has the claim of fame of being the origin of Boom Headshot. Boom Headshot! Boom Headshot! If you've never seen it, it's a great series. They're classics. To this day, endlessly quotable as well. The Duplicate Orange is a play on Super Mario 3D World's Double Cherry, but with a brilliant bit of wordplay. I know cherries visually come in pairs quite often, but come on, Nintendo, get on this level of pun crafting. I don't know why Henry sticks the whole unpeeled orange and his fist in his mouth to eat it. What an animal. One of the Henrys is shot and one succeeds, yet it counts as a fail since we do not know if the original Henry or clone made it through. The lag switch plays old school dial up internet sound effects and has Henry running in place before jumping far ahead. Apparently this is a real thing used by FPS game hackers used to slow down the network for everyone but themselves. 
This route really likes to play up the fact that this is actually a game, eh? Speaking of, that's about to become very relevant again. The tanks stored here is based on those from Advanced Wars, which is something within the series that was established in Fleeing the Complex. More fourth wall game breaking, walkthrough is something that I both love and hate in this game. You know, a friendly, jokey kind of hate. It's made to lampoon everything that people dislike about Let's Plays and the YouTube community. I think it's great, but as someone who makes YouTube videos and Let's Plays, I can't can't help but feel like the mirror is being turned on me here for this joke. I think it's a hilarious parody and an effective way to essentially pull an in before on all YouTubers for the Stickman collection. Henry is watching this on NewTube with its little tank logo. It's meant to be a joke combination of Newgrounds and YouTube. I love the janky title of this video and the fact that it's barely viewed and heavily disliked. It's incredible that there is an infinite loop nested within of the walkthrough guy showing you how to do the walkthrough section of the game. For some reason, Instagram is unchanged, but we have Twitter, Facebook, and something that I'm guessing was improv Pimbus. Make sure to follow me on Instagram, follow me on Twitter, follow me on um, Face, uh, follow me on Instagram, follow me on Facebook, follow me on Follow me on, on Pimbus. The joke with this section is that the game will select and stitch together scenes in a random order, done in a way to make it seem like it's being uniquely animated. On my playthrough, I watched it for about 5 minutes before I caught on, and once you finally click away from things, it tells you precisely how much time you just wasted on it. There's a minimum time spent of 15 seconds before it allows you to skip. You basically have to spam click through the scene to cut it off at 15 seconds exactly, and if you do, you earn the achievement Speed Run Strap. Now, this didn't come out totally perfect, as the scene was never meant to be stitched together and viewed in this way, but I attempted to gather the footage from every possible instance, remove the clips of Henry clicking around, and stitch together in a way that plays chronologically. It's not going to be perfect, but I thought it would be a fun challenge. Hey everyone, this is part 65 of my Henry Stickman playthrough. Today I'm going to be doing the part with the tank. But uh, before I get started, I just want to thank my sponsor. Before I get started, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe on my video. Uh, don't forget to like, don't forget to comment, uh, don't forget um, to subscribe. Uh, make sure you watch till the end of the video. I'm doing a special giveaway at the end. This game has a lot of fails in it. I'm only like halfway through. I've gotten up to like 400,000 fails. Can't believe they're able to reference this really obscure. Well, this part's a huge spoiler, so if you don't want to see it, you should probably close your eyes. And this part's kind of a big spoiler, so you might be tempted to pick the more logical choice here. This game doesn't really follow any logic at all. It's kind of annoying. You would expect this not to work, but uh, you know how this game is. Things are in the tent now. Uh, I'm going to pick walk through here. Opens up this video of this super boring guy who just says, Now you got three choices here. If you, if you pick walk through, it starts playing a video of this really boring guy. Who's all like, and if you pick walkthrough, you get this big Dumbo who's all, now, you sh now you'll come up to a big tank, and if you choose walkthrough here, it makes uh, this guy who's all, and when you get to this tank part, you want to pick walkthrough, it'll play this video of a guy who starts talking and he's like, tank, you get three options, you want to pick walkthrough here, uh, it goes up to this video of a guy who says, sees the big tank, and you want to choose walkthrough here, and it uh, makes a guy come out, and he keeps saying like, What's up guys, I'm playing Henry Stickman today, doing a walkthrough. Hey guys, back to the video again, playing uh, Henry Stickman today. Uh, welcome back to part 65 of my Henry Stickman playthrough, walkthrough. Hey, what's up guys? Time for another walkthrough. This is part 65, Henry Stickman Gaming. Hey guys, back to the video again, playing uh, Henry Stickman today. Hey guys, this is gonna be a walkthrough of Henry Stickman game. What's up guys, I'm playing Henry Stickman today, doing a walkthrough. Why are they bringing that guy with the helicopter and the headset? He comes in at this part. I got a Patreon account if you feel like uh, supporting me some more. Remember to ring the bell, remember to uh, comment if you liked the video, comment and um, subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Make sure you leave a comment, it's very important, it helps me out. Uh, make sure to follow me on Instagram, follow me on Twitter, follow me on um, Face, uh, follow me on Instagram, follow me on Facebook, follow me on, follow me on, on Pimbus. 
Puff recorded multiple takes of a few parts to disguise the fact it is repeating sections over and over. The dedication to include every memeable bit of YouTuber calls to action, stumbling on his words, including lots of gross mouth noises. The love-hate relationship should be all the more clear. The correct option is the Scrambler, which sends Big Boy the Tank AWOL. Big Boy is the name of a weapon in Fallout, but I doubt it's an intended direct reference. Seems like just kind of a generic name, something fun to give to a big tank. We have the return of the Center for Chaos Containment, who were first introduced in stealing the diamond, were prominent in infiltrating the airship, and actually absent in fleeing the complex other than one lone character. This is Mobile Unit A113. This is an insider easter egg used by various animation studios, notably Disney and Pixar. Although it has become common elsewhere over time, others have gotten on board with the joke. It was originally made in reference to the classroom for graphic design and character animation students at the California Institute of the Arts. Graduates of that class started slipping it into their movies, and now it shows up everywhere. This panel that the agent can select from is much like that seen at the end of Stealing the Diamond having a series of buttons, toggles, and sliders to choose from. This speaker radios a phantom, who is meant to be a play on the StarCraft ghost. These camouflaged snipers are capable of calling a nuclear strike in-game. Their line... Never know what hit them. They'll never know what hit them. And the launch sequence are recreation of those heard in StarCraft. Nuclear launch detected. That's right. Yeah, I've got a... Nuclear launch detected. The fail text jokes about them having a surplus of nuclear bombs. They do also drop one in stealing the diamond. I suppose two is more than anyone really needs. We could call that a surplus. It is assumed with the slider that some sort of temperature freeze will take place. Instead, the game is just paused, which I suppose is an ultimate freeze. Chaos contained. Seriously though, between the physics engine, lag switch, walkthrough, and this pause, this route plays off of this literally being a game more than any other. I suppose that awareness makes sense considering that this is the route the secret ending is buried within. I'll cover that towards the end of the video. The heart button sounds a deep clock bong before the moon turns into the sinister moon seen in The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. I don't know if he's willfully sinister, I shouldn't attribute motive, maybe he's just having a bad day. In that game, you are continually manipulating time in an effort to stop the moon from crashing into the planet at the end of the third day. The moon crashing here is in reference to that storyline, and during the fail text, we hear the laugh of the happy mask salesman. <laughs> The fail text is a quote taken directly from The Light of Courage Part 3, which is instead a fan-animated series based on a janky Zelda fanfic. You should have thought about what I am willing to do in order to get the job done. The fingerprint scanner summons the Gabeg, which is meant to be named after Gabe Newell, often called Gaben. We saw another Gabe-based piece of tech from the CCC before, when they attempted to bring on the Gaben in infiltrating the airship. They have a bit more success with the Gabeg. After an action-filled battle, the raid is aborted and Henry secures his place as the Top At leader. We earn the ending, Top At for Life, which is itself named after Top At for Life, Yes, hello. The song Reginald has as a ringtone in Fleeing the Complex. And our last branch combo to cover, Rapidly Promoted Executive and The Betrayed. With Rapidly Promoted Executive, you specifically cannot pair this option with International Rescue Operative. Here, you are a criminal through and through, and would not have been able to have teamed up with the government after. Instead, Henry was the leader of the Top Ats, and was rescued by them at the Wall, only for Reginald to drop him into the ocean. Prior to this game coming out, many assumed Henry died in that ending. We now have confirmation? He was rescued from that ocean, and saved with cybernetic enhancements. Dr. Vinch Pinchelstein mentioned having a previous run-in with the Top Ats. Through this, we can assume she was responsible for Right Hand Man's upgrades. Due to her obvious disdain, it appears she was forced to do so. Through her accent and use of Da, You had run-in with Top Hat Clan, da? It is very likely she is Russian, but Vinch Pinchelstein is definitely not Russian, and probably also not a correct pronunciation. 
it's not a real surname. Her name translates from Swedish to either Winch Pencil Stone or Winch the Pencil Path. Puff is fluent in Swedish, and maybe just liked the sound of these words mushed together? And if Vinch Pinchelstein is how you're meant to say it, then yeah, it is kind of fun. Henry busts through the front window of the airship, he's maybe just a big fan of a dramatic entrance, and he would have done this once before on this route at the beginning of Rapidly Promoted Executive. He immediately faces off against Right Hand Man for their rematch. I like the small detail that they essentially have inverse upgrades. Right Hand Man has enhancements on his right arm, legs, and face, while Henry has his torso and left arm. I worry I'm going to be a little lost through this route, as so much of it is made in direct reference to different animes, of which I at best know a select few. I'm gonna do my best to incorporate as much as I personally know, and half the time I'm just gonna assume it's Dragon Ball Z, but rather than blindly guessing that, I'm gonna kinda have to leave it out of the video, and rely on you guys a lot to fill in any blanks I might leave. Those efforts would be greatly appreciated. A cool feature early on in this route is the way the black bars pinch in to make things more widescreen and a little more cinematic. We had another route that was super heavy on the game inspiration, so this one leans a little more on the theatrics, cinema, and anime. First using gun form, Henry transforms his arm into a laser blasting gun. Right hand man rapidly dodges around it and pops up behind Henry. Nothing personnel, kid. Nothing personnel, kid, is an intentional mistake, referencing a cyborg Sonic fan character, Cold Steel the Hedgehog, who has a piece of fan art that features this particular typo. You made me use almost 10% of my power is more of a general joke used to riff on power scaling in anime, but it has been relatively recently popularized in a series of memes featuring Shaggy from Scooby-Doo and his supposed hidden powers. Whether it was meant to pull on that more specifically really is going to depend on when Puff was animating this scene. The spirit form has Henry summon his spirit reference, which itself is a joke on this whole scene being a reference, as well as the general spirit of the Henry Stickman series being so reference heavy. And yes, I can now specifically point out that while creating the logo for finding the references, in addition to me riffing off the idea of drawing words to look like the thing they represent, the way Puff does for the different series installments, which by the way is just like a fun thing to do. I used to do that in the margins of my notebook as well, draw the word slime to be slimy. I find it's a fun little exercise, I really liked making this logo, even if it does kind of look like fine wing. But for references, I use the color and design of the reference spirit as a template, thus making the the word reference a reference to reference. Are there enough layers in there for you? While the subtitles refer to them as reference, I've been told the actual translation of this dialogue would instead be tribute. This is a nod to the way character names are often slightly changed in the JoJo series when localized, usually to avoid copyright infringement, a practice that I'm sure Puff can relate to heavily upon updating the old games for this collection, removing many instances of copyrighted sound effects, music, and designs. The entire idea of these battling spirits is a reference to the stand battles in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. The change in art style with heavy black shading is a wonderful recreation of that series' style. I just love the little details like seeing their heavily shaded lips, or the redrawing of the airship itself. It goes a long way in selling all of this. Some have said that Right Hand Man's Hourglass could potentially be a play on the Phantom Hourglass, but he also describes filling it with the Sands of Time, which makes me think Prince of Persia, but really it could just be an entirely unique thing for this character. The fail ends in the typical way seen in JoJo episodes with the to-be-continued arrow being replaced by mission failed. The fail text, that doesn't seem right, but I don't know enough about anime to dispute it, is a reference to this line from Mac in It's Always Sunny. Or I could burn it up and get a nice smoky smell in here and let that smoke go into the sky where it turns into stars. <sighs> that doesn't sound right, but I don't know enough about stars to dispute it. No, it's right. Fun fact, this scene has the claim to fame of being the longest fail in the entire series. You know, excluding walkthroughs, since you can technically do that one in 15 seconds. Blade form has the two changing their arms into swords, having a big old sword fight. Henry manages to disable Right Hand Man's eye, but in a rage, he begins summoning a giant laser orb. That reminds me of Vegeta's Powerball. His pure hatred and rage is also really putting out major Vegeta energy. Henry can attempt to absorb the energy blast, but it overcharges his enhancements, causing them to blow up. Wow, that's gotta be the play of the game. 
selecting this blue text plays the sequence in first person from right hand man's perspective. With a UI and countdown that are all made to look like that play of the game feature in Overwatch. I like the small details like you can see some of the other skills of right hand man, like the laser eye. Playing this sequence earns the achievement play of the game. This is play of the game? As this feature is automated in Overwatch, players are often left underwhelmed by what moments end up earning this status. The Y-type move, Big Blast, is a reference to the Z-type moves first seen in Pokemon Sun and Moon. The Y pose held by Henry in the options screen is very similar to the beginning part of the YMCA dance, although that might be more of a coincidence than anything else. I maybe wouldn't point it out at all, but it's kind of funny that Henry doesn't actually even do this pose at any point during his Y type move. As the airship is going down, Henry specifically confronts Reginald. This has maybe all gone a little too far. If you select airship, Henry kind of snaps and holds Reginald in front of the airship as it crashes into the unlaunched orbital station, taking them both out. The fail text is not even a text, it's just three Stickman style Pog Champ emotes from Twitch. Obviously this game was made and came out before Twitch did away with this original version. Although even though it has been removed, it is still a reference to that original. Puff actually has this drawn version as an emote in his own Twitch, titled Pogman. Henry can flip the betrayal ending on Reginald and attempt to drop him over the edge. However, he floats to safety and calls in reinforcements. The overly exaggerated, silly way Henry reacts to being shot so many times reminds me a little bit of the bail fail from fleeing the complex. It's just a fun cartoon way of seeing someone get shot up like crazy. It really lessens the impact of how gruesome it truly is. The successful option is to staple Reginald to the airship before it crash lands. Wall staples are one of Duster's thief tools in Mother 3. They can specifically be used to immobilize enemies in battle. Reginald dies shortly after, while Henry wanders away from the wreckage. It is in these final moments, the 21 by 9 aspect ratio gives way to the standard framing of the rest of the game. As Henry's gaze drifts off into the distance, this ending is unique in that it does not cut away to a separate splash image with the ending title. It instead fades in, overlaid on this final scene. This feels very fitting to me, as the final route I'm covering, Revenged, is the one that specifically ends with Henry passing away. Sure, we We've seen him die hundreds of times, but never an ending that specifically ends with him passing away. Something else that's kind of funny in a more personal way is that in my own Let's Play of this series, when tackling completing the mission, Revenged ended up being the first route I chose and played, while in this series, it's the last. I just wanted to take a second to appreciate the coincidence of how that played out. Character bios. At this point, I have covered most reference-based bios in the rest of the episodes of this series, but I was actually surprised how many unique characters there are that still only pop up in these routes. I still have a fair number to cover. Hank Stockman is one of several characters in the series who's meant to have a name that's just similar to Henry Stickman. His aviators and mustache feel very similar to Nick Goose Bradshaw in Top Gun. Mad Lad is simply named after the meme and phrase, whatever we're gonna call it, of, you know, someone being a Mad Lad. He also drinks the fictional Kerpow energy drink that's named after the comic book onomatopoeias that you see. Now we know of two in-world energy drinks. Timothy Turner has his big front teeth and a name that's meant to be a play on Timmy Turner from the Fairly Odd Parents. Norm Hexter. Norm and Hex are both math-related terms, as well as Hexter kind of being like Hacker, Texter, and Hacksaw all merged together for this techie character. Gerald Gruff, he has a low, gruff-sounding voice. Orban Lamp? Lamp? That took me like nine takes to say, and that's as good as I could get. Why is Lamp like the hardest thing to say? He's got to be something, right? That name is so unique and odd that I refuse to believe there isn't a reference in there somewhere. Curly Brown has a name much like Charlie Brown, but the Peanuts cartoon wasn't especially notable for its cartoon logic and physics the way something, say, Looney Tunes would, so there might be another reference intended or layered into this one. Beans. Bees? He just thinking about those beans. Skeev is a CD sneak of a character, and their name is literally just a play on the word skeevy. Jose Gonzalez is a play on a generic fake name used to refer to new players in Team Fortress 2, which, as the bio refers to, is a free-to-play game, and if they're new to the game, they obviously would have the default hat. Variants on this name that players have used over the years are Pablo Gonzalez and Jose Gonzalez, usually stylized with a year at the end to indicate the player 
player is young. You know, like they would have typed 2007 or 2008 at the end, like their birth year. I'm not sure if people still make this joke online. If they do, I guess you'd have to update it a bit. Jose Gonzalez underscore 2012, things like that. Uger Crip is in reference to the Boulder Fist Ogre from Hearthstone, which players commonly intentionally misspell their name as Boulder Fist Uger, playing on the seemingly dumb nature of that character. His flavor text is, me have good stats for the cost. The improper grammar of Uger's bio plays on that as as well, and the last name Crip is likely lifted from Hearthstone streamer Kriparian. Mac Dandy is simply a play on the phrase Mac Daddy. Dr. Glass could be a reference to Mr. Glass from Unbreakable, with the joke being that if he isn't actually a doctor, then this character's name would literally be Mr. Glass as well. It's a fun roundabout way of getting there. Barbershop Bill apparently only has the look to go with the name, as he can neither cut hair nor can he sing a cappella like a barbershop quartet. Frankie Pizza is a reference to Frank Pizza, who played on the Boston Celtics and was featured in Germa Rumble 3. Howard Lipton feels completely useless if he doesn't have his morning tea. Lipton is a very common tea brand. Billy Brown, for seven years he's never washed behind his ears, is a reference to a line from a 1932 animated short, Santa's Workshop, made by Disney. But Billy Brown for seven years hasn't washed behind his ears! Dan D. Lyons found a perfect combo of detergents. I would suspect that the resulting smell is that of a gorgeous field of daisies. June July being born in August is just simple and hilarious. Timu Suomi is from Finland. Timu is a common Finnish name, and Suomi is literally Finnish for Finland. If you want to take it a step further, Timu does translate from Finnish into theme, so his name is Theme Finland. He's a Finnish themed character. Jerry Atrix is getting up there in age and his name is a direct play on geriatric. Merle Goldenfold is potentially a reference to Mr. Goldenfold from Rick and Morty. Frederick Munster's last name is named after a cheese, and he wears a top hat literally made out of cheese. Now that we've covered the full game, I can go back and finally show all the locations of the Hidden Among Us crewmates in completing the mission. There are 12 in total. I'll cover them in the order I covered the endings of this series. There are two in Cleaned Em Out, after Henry and the train arrive at the launch site, the yellow crewmate is atop this crate. Later, on the rocket, when using the leaf mode, the blue crewmate is on top of this crate. In Triple Threat, when Henry and Ellie use parasols, the brown crewmate is on the far right inside of the tower. During Valiant Hero, when choosing the different escape pods, the cyan crewmate is nested among the different top at members in the luxury escape pod. After Henry teleports into the vault during Duel Baron, there is a purple crewmate. Although it can be seen slightly sooner, you can't actually collect it until the teleport is complete. In this silly scene with Ice Pick and Sal Malone arguing over trading hats early on in Stickman Space Resort, the Lime crewmate can be found in the back of the open truck. Playing off the fact that the remote fail during the free man route is already an Among Us reference, a white crewmate can be found floating in space. In Capital Gains, when Ellie and Henry are standing on the heap of gold in the wrecked train car, an orange crewmate is stashed among the loot. In Master Bounty Hunter, after sneaking the squad into the warehouse with Convert, the red crewmate is found next to a cabinet. Top at Civil Warfare has Jeffrey's Midnight Surprise plan, during which time the pink crewmate can be found in the vent, which itself is a fun nod to the vent use in the Among Us game. That'll become all the more meaningful as soon as the airship map drops. During Top at For Life, when Elias Bot Chin activates the Phantom, the green crewmate is located next to them. I think this is a clever little gag, and that green is commonly used for jungle camouflage, and the ghost, or phantom, is known for their special camouflage abilities, so there might be layers there, or it just made sense to stick the green crewmate next to some green. But finally, in the opening part of Revenged, the black crewmate is next to Henry's bed when first waking up. There is one fakeout crewmate during Valiant Hero. During the trash ball fail, a tan crewmate is clickable. The game attempts to tally it, but it is punched away instead. This is a joke based on the fact that the tan color was eventually removed from Among Us. And finally, the secret ending that ties so much of the larger game together. 
After earning every fail and ending in all the games from breaking the bank through to completing the mission, you can initiate this end. In the top app for life route, on that final choice screen with a panel of buttons and toggles, you can clear away the different sticky notes to uncover the multiverse imbalance. Do not reveal secret. Seriously, do not. There is nothing here. Pressing the button marked fix then restores balance by defragmenting the many multiverse branches and correcting a supposed plot hole, teleporting the box of goods to the prison that Henry first accesses to initiate his escape. Interestingly, this sets us one year earlier, showing that escaping the prison through to the end of the series took about one year. Although based on dates of camera footage and Gadget Gabe tech reviews, we know that the total time of the series is likely a bit longer. This seems to indicate that Henry actually did some hard time in escaping the prison rather than getting away immediately. I'm throwing that out there, it's a possibility. I won't get too hung up on all that. I made an entire video specifically discussing this secret ending and some of those possibilities, so I'd recommend that as a follow-up if you're interested. This is followed by a very sweet thank you from Puff for for enjoying the series for all these years. Well, thank you for making them. As if I didn't love the series enough and appreciate the work put in, Henry Stickman will now forever have an extra special place in my heart, as being the game that really helped this channel break out and take those final steps towards potentially going full time. That is really special and something that I can forever credit to Henry Stickman. You know, and, and Puffballs and the rest of the Inner Sloth crew. But there's something fun about attributing it to a fictional character as well. So once again, thank Thank you Puffballs, thank you Inner Sloth. Thank you guys all for watching this series, helping along the way. I promised I'd bring it back up at the end of the video. The Kickstarter for Jake Friend's Scrabdackle is going live on March 16th. There is officially a landing page for that Kickstarter. It would be so helpful for us if you followed the links in the description and the pinned comment, and followed that Kickstarter to check it out in a little over two weeks when the actual campaign goes live. It is a non-linear, exploration-based game about a wizard's first adventure. The heart of the game is all about finding your way through the world, meeting crazy characters, discovering loads of secrets, learning and utilizing spells to access new areas of the game in whatever order you see fit. You can play the game pretty peacefully, and there are also some assist options if you prefer a casual experience. But if you want the challenge, the game has a really robust combat system. Enemies telegraph all their attacks. There are so many boss battles, all of which have multiple different stages to them. There is just so much going into this game. Jake is a fantastic dev. The vision he has for this game is incredible and just so clear. I fell in love with it. I think you guys will too. So please, please keep an eye out for that. Go follow that campaign. And if it's after March 16th, it'll be live for 30 days. Consider donating. I want to thank patrons of the channel. I'm planning to start incorporating a patron credit section in the end cards of these videos. I'll play around with that at the end of this video. You guys let me know if it looks good, I guess. Maybe consider donating if you want to be a part of that. But Scrabdackle should get your attention first, I insist. Thank you all so much for watching. Thank you for sticking with me. As I put this series together, it took a lot of work and a lot more time than anticipated, but it's been a blast. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon.